Starship Flight 10 may have happened a while ago, but it's still full of hidden details that could surprise many. Recently, SpaceX revealed a new finding about the mission, specifically regarding the Super Heavy booster. According to the company, the booster actually performed even better than expected. So, what exactly did it do that impressed SpaceX so much? Let's find out. During the 10th flight of Starship, the Super Heavy booster pulled off a successful boost back burn and hot stage separation. Unlike the previous flight, where SpaceX pushed the envelope by increasing the angle of attack during re-entry to test thermal dynamics, this time they went with a more conservative approach. The goal was simple, give the booster a better shot at surviving re-entry, because something even more important was planned later in the flight. About six minutes in, the booster lit up again, this time attempting a 13-engine ignition for the landing burn. One of those engines had already failed during ascent and stayed offline. On top of that, one of the three center engines typically used for the final landing phase was intentionally disabled. Why? SpaceX wanted to test if a backup engine from the middle ring could take over and still get the job done. Then came the most dramatic part. The booster dropped to just two center engines for the final moments, smoothly hovering above the ocean before shutting down and dropping into the gulf. It was an impressive performance from Super Heavy Booster 16. At least, that's what we could see from the outside. But how did it look from SpaceX's point of view? At the American Astronautical Society's Glenn Space Technology Symposium on September 8th, Bill Gerstenmeier, SpaceX's Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability, shared new insights into Starship Flight 10, with one of the key focuses being the performance of the Super Heavy booster. Gerstenmeier explained that SpaceX was analyzing the booster's angle of attack and how well it could control itself during flight. This is crucial to understanding whether, in future missions, the booster could reliably return and land at the launch tower, a key goal in making Starship fully reusable. But what stood out most was Gerstenmeier's admission that, technically, they shouldn't be able to pull off the kind of return maneuvers they've been attempting. Yet, the flight data is showing otherwise. We've essentially demonstrated, through actual flight, that we have more stability than what either computational fluid dynamics, or CFD models, or wind tunnel testing predicted, he said. So, what does that actually mean? To understand why, it helps to know what those CFD and wind tunnel tests actually are, and how much trust engineers usually place in them. In aerospace engineering, one of the first major challenges when designing a launch vehicle is figuring out its aerodynamic behavior. Engineers need to understand how controllable the rocket will be under different conditions, whether it will remain stable throughout flight, and how those factors will affect the payload it can carry into orbit. This foundational work is often done well before a vehicle ever flies, using tools like wind tunnels and computer simulations. For wind tunnel testing, basically, you blow air past a model of the rocket at different speeds, and then you measure all the forces acting on it. Forward, backward, side to side, and all the twisting and turning motions too. That data gets stored in a big database that helps the guidance, navigation, and control systems know what to expect during actual flight. Usually, big fans push the air through the tunnel. The rocket, or a part of it, is mounted so it can't move, and you just watch how the air flows over it. The model can be tiny or full-sized, depending on the tunnel. Of course, with something like Starship, you can't really test the full vehicle in a wind tunnel unless you've got a truly massive facility, which SpaceX doesn't have at Starbase. So, you test what you can. Wind tunnels aren't just for Earth, either. They can be set up to mimic other planets, like Mars, which has a really thin atmosphere. That helps engineers figure out how vehicles and parachutes will behave when landing on other worlds. Now, on the other side of things, there's CFD, computational fluid dynamics. CFD takes a different approach. Rather than physical models, it uses advanced mathematics, physics, and computer algorithms to simulate how fluids, like air, will flow around the vehicle. It can model airflow, pressure changes, turbulence, and other complex effects. These simulations are often run on powerful supercomputers and can offer incredibly detailed predictions about how a rocket will behave in flight, from the plume of its exhaust to the sloshing of fuel inside its tanks. Both wind tunnel tests and CFD simulations are extremely useful, especially because they're much more affordable than building and flying full-scale hardware. 
even for a company like SpaceX, which has made rockets far more cost-effective than traditional aerospace programs, reducing the number of test flights needed saves enormous time and money. These ground-based tools help engineers refine and validate designs before risking anything in the air. But as good as CFD and wind tunnels are, they're still just models. They're not the real world. They come with assumptions, simplifications, and boundaries. Every simulation is just an educated guess based on equations, inputs, and ideal conditions. And yeah, CFD models often look really cool, those colorful animations and airflow patterns you see in presentations. But they're still just that, visualizations of an approximation, a fancy simulation of how we think things might go, not a guarantee. Nonetheless, it's true that in Flight 10, the booster performed even better than SpaceX expected. Now, just as they thoroughly investigate what went wrong after a flight, they need to deeply understand what went right this time. Who knows? SpaceX might discover an alternative approach that makes it work even better. And knowing the company, they're not afraid to make changes or take a different path if it leads to better results. Flight 11 may be their best and possibly final opportunity to do that, as it will mark the last flight of the Block 2 Starship Super Heavy before transitioning to the upgraded Block 3 version. That next generation booster includes numerous changes that set it apart from its predecessor. One of the most significant upgrades is a completely redesigned internal fuel transfer tube. So large, it's roughly the same size as the entire first stage of a Falcon 9. This new system is designed to move cryogenic fuel from the main tank down to all 33 Raptor engines more efficiently. Crucially, it enables all 33 engines to ignite simultaneously, a major step forward in reliability and thrust control. Block 3 will also introduce SpaceX's new Raptor 3 engines and feature a fully redesigned interstage configuration. If SpaceX wants to precisely replicate what made Booster 16 perform better than expected, Flight 11 could be their last real chance before these sweeping changes take effect. Speaking of Block 3, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently expressed confidence that Starship version 3 will begin delivering 100 tons of payload to orbit as early as next year, with full reuse of both stages. In an interview during the All In Summit on September 9th, Musk stated that he expects version 3 to start flying in 2026, with both the Super Heavy booster and the Starship upper stage being recovered and reused. Unless we have some very major setbacks, uh, SpaceX will demonstrate uh, full reusability next year, uh, catching both the booster and the ship, um, and being able to deliver over 100 tons to a useful orbit. That level of performance is critical for SpaceX, not only to deploy larger, next-generation Starlink satellites into orbit, but also to support the lunar lander variant of Starship being developed for NASA's Artemis program. Speaking about the new rocket, Elon Musk described the third-generation Starship as a gigantic upgrade, noting that it features the new Raptor 3 engines and includes major changes across nearly every aspect of the vehicle. Pretty much everything changes on the rocket with version 3, he said, calling it a radical redesign. However, Musk also cautioned that such a major overhaul could come with initial teething pains. One of the most significant technical challenges SpaceX faces with Starship is the heat shield. No one's ever made a fully reusable orbital heat shield, Musk explained. For Starship, the heat shield must be able to withstand extreme re-entry temperatures, remain lightweight, avoid transferring heat to the primary structure, and resist damage. The tiles can't crack, and as you ascend, if you hit rain, the tiles can't dissolve in the rain, he added. Crucially, the system must also be reliable without requiring time-consuming inspections. You really need to know that these tiles are working. You can't go through this laborious inspection, Musk said. These tens of thousands of tiles all need to work and not need to be refurbished or checked one by one, as was the case with the shuttle. In the interview, Elon Musk also spoke about Starlink, specifically addressing the massive $17 billion Spectrum deal with EchoStar. He explained that while SpaceX has acquired Spectrum rights worth $17 billion, turning that investment into actual coverage will depend heavily on smartphone compatibility, something he expects to materialize within the next two years. Another major challenge, he noted, is the need to build satellites capable of operating on these new frequency bands. The deal has already made waves in the telecommunications industry, causing the stock prices of several major carriers to dip. When asked whether SpaceX plans to become a global mobile carrier through Starlink, 
Musk acknowledged that it's one of the options, but clarified, we're not going to put the other carriers out of business. He added that traditional telecom providers will continue to play a role, as they own a lot of spectrum. Toward the end of the interview, Elon Musk shared his thoughts on the future of space exploration, particularly missions to the moon and Mars. He said that while going to the moon is worthwhile, the goal shouldn't just be to land there, but to establish a permanent lunar base, similar to a research outpost. There are parts of the moon that may be older than parts of the Earth, Musk noted, suggesting that a science base on the moon could help us better understand the origins and nature of the universe. That would be very cool, he said. Looking beyond the moon, Musk emphasized the importance of building a self-sustaining city on Mars. The key test, he said, would be whether Mars could continue to thrive even if resupply missions from Earth were to stop. At the point where Mars can prosper and grow on its own, that's when we know it's truly self-sustaining. So when might this happen? Musk, as usual, offered an ambitious timeline. If things go and break our way, he said, I think it can be done in 30 years. He explained that with exponential growth in the amount of cargo sent to Mars during each transfer window, opportunities that occur every 26 months, reaching self-sufficiency could be achievable. If we see exponential increases in tonnage to Mars with every transfer window, Musk said, then it should be possible to make Mars self-sustaining in roughly 25 years, maybe as few as 10 to 15 transfer windows. So, 25 years until a city on Mars. Do you think that's possible? Let me know in the comments below.